Lovely to see you all. Thanks for tuning in this evening. Let me ask you a question to begin with. And the question is this one, what do you find uh, beautiful? Um, maybe um, it is a place that you love to go to, somewhere that um, makes you stop and wonder and takes your breath away. A few weeks ago, we went to uh, Dorset um, for, for, a, for a day trip. And we went to, um, we, walk, we walked up the hill from Lulworth Cove to Durdle Door and then back again. I don't know if you know the area, it's just a, a stunning place. Uh, as we came back down the hill towards the cove, the, the, the light was fading. The autumn mists covered the, the um, cottages in the village. Um, the smoke from the chimney blurred into the mist and then you could uh, see and hear the waves uh, crashing dramatically um, against the, the cliffs as we walked down. It's just a, a beautiful place, somewhere um, visually stunning. Um, a place maybe for you it's a person you think of when you think of someone beautiful maybe it's um a, a car or an equation or a film um or a a painting um and the thing about beauty uh, wh whatever comes to mind is that it's something that is powerful something that must uh, stop something that does something to us um although we may think of ourselves as, as rational logical uh, people and um, the reality is that often so much uh, or a much stronger driver is something that we find attractive. Um, beauty is powerful. What uh, do you find beautiful? The thing we're going to see this evening is that God's plan for the church is to create a people um, who reveal his beauty to the watching world. And we're going to see that the, that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is to so take root in our hearts that it, it, it does something to us. It, it, it changes us in such a way that makes the world look and stop and wonder and see the beauty of God and his ways in us. That's what we're thinking about this evening. Now, Titus, um, if you have been um, coming along, is all about how the gospel leads to godliness, how it transforms us. And it's Paul's letter written to his friend Titus, living in the island of Crete. Uh, Titus is there and his job is to establish healthy churches throughout the island. And at heart, what Paul wants for Titus is to preach the gospel so as to transform the churches, so as to bring change to society. Um, a bit of a recap. Um, the f the, to begin with, we, saw, we thought about the gospel and the Christian. Now, God's big goal for individual believers is that we grow in faith, in godliness and in hope. Uh, last week, we thought about the gospel and leaders, how the heart of a, a healthy church will begin with healthy leaders. And those, those leaders are those um, are elders who teach and model the gospel. And this evening we're thinking about the gospel and the church. The question is, what difference should the gospel make to our lives today? Um, I believe we've got a reader. If you get a get out of Bible and we'll have Titus chapter two. Okay, so the reading is Titus chapter two. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith, in love and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands, that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted that in every way they will make the teaching about God our saviour attractive. For the grace of God has appeared that off offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much. So what difference should the gospel make to our lives today? Well, here's the first thing we're going to see. Our lives should make the gospel attractive. 
Uh, look at verse one, you'll notice uh, that Paul wants Titus to teach what is um, appropriate to sound doctrine. Uh, and what that means, I think, is he's saying that he wants Titus to teach the Christians to live lives that are worthy of the gospel, um, that live the kind of lives that, that we the Christians have been saved to live. If you remember the false teachers, the end of chapter one are those who deny God by their actions. But Christians, well, we're supposed to do the opposite. Uh, we're to show God by our actions. And what Paul does, you'll, you'll notice, as, you, as that was just read to us, is um, he, he points out how this is to work according to age, gender and role. He speaks to older men, older women, uh, younger women, younger men and then to slaves. And these are kind of broad categories um, as, as, he, as he looks at the church. And as we read this today, we kind of uh, put ourselves where we uh, fit most naturally. They're broad categories. They're also quite flexible categories. I mean, it may be that as you think about your role in the church, you end up playing uh, more of a role, say, as an old, of an older Christian, even if you're not necessarily that um, advanced in years. So they're broad categories and flexible. And what you may have noticed is that as Paul talks about how these believers are to live out sound doctrine, um, to, to live what in a life is appropriate to sound doctrine, he talks about the impact that he intends there to be. Verse five, verse eight, verse 10. Did you notice he repeats that phrase? So that, verse five, so that no one will malign the word of God. Verse eight, uh, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Verse 10, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our savior attractive. Can you see our lives should make the gospel attractive. The power of the Christian life, that's what we're thinking about. And we're supposed to live as, as Christians in such a way um, that stops people speaking against the gospel. And that gives people no ammunition when they want to, that makes people stop and think and see the beauty of God and his ways. Our lives should make the gospel attractive. How's that gonna work? Well, let's think first about um, older men. Uh, older men are to be worthy of respect. Verse two, he says, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and endurance. Uh, temperate, that's the idea of being sober minded. They're going to need to think very clearly. Uh, self-controlled, and um, that's repeated a lot um, in, in this text. We're going to see that's a, that's a pretty vital characteristic for every single Christian, and it's to be modelled by older men. Uh, worthy of respect, and literally, it's the, the idea of being serious uh, or grave, not not in a kind of Scrooge like gloomy way. Someone who's just negative about everything and talks about the good old days um, someone who can't see the funny side of anything. But that is I, th I think it's someone who is serious about the right things, um, not flippant or foolish. Someone who cares about what really matters and so worthy of respect. Uh, someone is to be someone who's to be sound in faith, in love and endurance. An older Christian man is to be mature in these vital Christian characteristics, a, a strong faith in God, a deep love for God's people, a patient endurance that has developed over time. An older Christian man is to be like an oak tree, a solid, strong, secure, dependable, reliable, uh, worthy of respect. Now, there's a sense, I suppose, in which a respect should be given to all older people. But there's also a sense in which it is earned. Um, I used to be a school teacher and I, I learned um, pretty much the hard way um, that respect is not a given. You have to earn it. You have to show that you are worthy of respect and people will respect you. And that's how it works, too, with older men. An older man is to be worthy of respect. Uh, what about um, women? Well, older women, um, verse three, they are to be reverent. I likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Uh, and in a similar way, older women are to be marked by holiness and by reverence. Uh, that is, an older woman, she's to be someone who fears God and someone who serves him. Uh, Paul mentions two particular dangers to uh, avoid, an excess of wine and an excess of words. Um, Slander and drinking, which I don't suppose are, are kind of unique problems for older women, but um, common problems for older women. And he then explicitly goes on to talk about the key role that she has in teaching 
and training the younger women. Um, that goes on in, in verse four. And where an older woman lives like this, uh, where she fears God, where she does what is good uh, and seeks to train and be an encouragement to other people, to use Peter's language, she displays and shows a beauty that does not fade. She's been marked by reverence. Now, it's interesting that he talks about the key role here of older men and older women. Um, some churches seem to sort of delight in being full of young people, as if that's a kind of a mark of them being a church worth being in. But you know, Paul's thinking older people are, are vital for the health of the church. If you're an older person listening, and I really can't see who's listening, I see my PowerPoint and a few people. If you are an older person uh, listening in, then please see how important your role can be in the church. Please keep on living a life of faithfulness to God, uh, because you will be more influential in the lives of younger people than you realise. I remember as a student showing up in the church uh, and there was a, a church, lots of young people, but there was one particular, a bearded, grey haired American widower in his late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and he had a slow walk and a, a twinkle in his eye. And I remember for some reason when I first encountered him, being slightly put off by him uh, and sort of thinking, you know, why is this guy here with all these younger people? Uh, he was a humble man, a jovial, reflective self-effacing, quite slow in lots of ways, in the kind of way he approached life, and not loud, not young, not abrasive, not particularly impressive uh, to me at first. But I remember looking back and seeing how it took me a while to realise that he was actually everything a young Christian man should want to be. And as I reflect, I, I often think about him and, and, the, and the life that he lived uh, and the life that I would like to live um, in following him. So if you are an older person listening in, please don't fail to see the impact that you can have on younger Christians. We then goes on to talk about younger women. And he sum, to sum it up here, marked by love and devotion. Uh, verse four, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. It might surprise you to hear um, that younger women need to be trained by older women uh, to love their husbands and love their children. I guess you might think, well, hold on, isn't that just obvious? Isn't that a given? Won't they just do that? I guess the answer is, well, not necessarily. Um, it is interesting when you think about it more broadly. All Christians are commanded to love pretty often in, in the Bible. It's not a given. I think Paul is just realistic here about sin and the difficulties of relationships. They need to be trained and reminded about the importance of loving husbands, loving children. I guess it also might be surprising uh, to hear the young women are told to be busy at home and to be subject to their husbands. Uh, we live in a society where we're told that female empowerment means liberation from male authority. It means equal opportunities, equal outcomes. Uh, and so often it also involves a huge emphasis placed upon paid work and career and self-fulfillment. Um, Daphne Keane, uh, the actress who plays uh, Lyra in His Dark Materials, recently said this, she said, as a woman, I feel I've been systematically told I can't make it. There are many things I can't achieve. I've been told to be on the sidelines, to be a great wife or mother. What is that about? Excuse me, she writes. And from her point of view, and, and I guess she probably reflects many the views of many others, the idea of being a wife or a mother is to be on the sidelines. And yet into this issue that the Bible says, actually, you know, that the good life is a life um, pursuing relationships. And where a woman has uh, a husband and children, pursuing those things is not to be on the sideline, missing out on the main event in life. In marriage, a wife is to be submissive to her husband. Now, that does not mean inferiority. It does not mean passivity. In the context of a, a relationship of mutual love and respect, a wife is to encourage her husband to lead her and she is to trust him in that, not forging her own path independently. And where a husband takes the initiative to cherish and care for his wife, she will flourish and not wither. In regards to motherhood, I don't think these verses mean a mother cannot pursue any paid work, but they do indicate the value and the priority 
of motherhood and child rearing. And that's to say where a Christian woman has children, that is to be where her heart is. And the logic is you, you don't have to be paid money or have institutional power or have a successful career to live a life of great value in God's sight, a life of great um, value in the, in the lives of others, of, a life of great benefit to other people. Because what lasts and what satisfies and what really makes a difference is relationships. I was reading uh, an interview recently uh, with the historian Andrew Marr, uh, and he was reflecting on his life and um, thinking about um, what had happened. And it's actually quite a sad interview to read because he admitted that he had, uh, over the years, uh, he placed his uh, work before his children. And he was talking about just how he regrets that choice, the choice made over years. And now he says, as a bit, a bit of an older man, that the thing that matters to him most is not his career, despite the fact that he's a pretty successful man, it is his relationship with his children. And that is what younger women and men too need to be reminded of. Love and devotion, investing in people, that is a life worth living. Uh, maybe you're a young woman listening in, but you're not married. And I think the principles still apply pretty strongly. Investing in relationships is the most important thing to do. That's the life that God calls his people to live, a life of love and devotion. And it's interesting um, that what feels quite controversial for us in theory, um, Paul says, well, well, that should be really attractive in practice. Where Christians pursue relationships first, it will be attractive to the outsider because God's design for his people, his design for families, for relationships, is a design which humanizes people because it values what really matters. And here, um, this verse six will, it, it, where, where young women are living like this, it will, it will stop people maligning the word of God. Even if in theory they don't like what the gospel teaches, they will be able to recognize that it is actually good for people. So the question for, for younger women, is your life gonna be marked by these things, by love and devotion? But what about younger men? Well, here we go, self-control, verse six. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Um, quite striking thing here for young men is that there really is only one command. We men, well, we can really only cope with one thing at a time. And the one thing for a young man to work on is simply this, self-control. Uh, learning to manage uh, the, the worldly and sinful passions. That is the chief work of a young man. Uh, anger, sexual desire, the tongue, eating, laziness, work, sleep. These things a young man must work on if he is to be useful to God. I think it's easy for a younger man to settle into sinful habits and excuse them as just sort of typical of being a young man. But you know, the Christian man, young man, cannot do this because this is what he is commanded to be self-controlled and Titus at verse 7 onwards and by extension the Christian leader is to be an example to younger men uh, especially we notice in the area of speech younger men are not to be crude or flippant or foolish or, or proud or constantly bantering no we're to have integrity and soundness of speech so the outsiders again can see the impact of the gospel on the life of the young men. So if you're a younger man listening in, the question is, are you making progress, progress being the key word, in self-control? Are you serious about it? Are you praying about it? Self-control. Final, finally, slaves, and he says, trustworthy, <clears throat> sums up how they're to be. Verse nine, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. So in every way, they'll make the teaching about God, our saviour, attractive. That's why I'm saying here that in this passage, Paul is not commenting on the rights and wrongs of slavery at the time. Of course, it's worth also remembering that, this, remembering that the slavery he's talking about here is not the kind of slavery we often think of when we think of slavery, a kind of enforced and abusive slavery that is tragically prevalent today and certainly is a mark of our history in Britain. Now, Paul's interest is more on how a slave is to act rather than whether he remains a slave or not. 
And so the obvious implication for us today would be the kind of would be the workplace, the employer employee relationship. And the key word when it comes to work is the word submission. The slave here is to willingly put himself under the care of his master and to please him. Notice not to talk back to them or badly about them and not to take from his master, but to please him, to be fully trusted. And again, it's, it's interesting that it's the idea of submission that will make somebody stop and look and think that the master will see something totally different in his servant who acts like this. Now, why is that? Well, I suppose because a servant heart is a rare thing and also a servant heart is a, is a beautiful thing. For many Christians today, um, the workplace uh, can sometimes feel like a hard place to live out faith. How do you actually glorify God at work? You're probably familiar with that idea of wanting to glorify God in everything and being told you must glorify God at work. But, but how do you actually do that? It, it might be hard to get to know people, hard to talk about serious things, hard to find motivation and purpose, more like uh, drudgery than joy. But here we see that the way that we serve at work is a wonderful opportunity to stand out and to make a mark. The Christian is to be eager to please our employers, uh, eager to please them in everything, uh, not complaining, not taking, but giving and being reliable. So that when the employer thinks, you know, who, who can I trust? who's on my side, who, who, who is totally reliable and dependable, they think, oh, it's that Christian. Yes, that's the person I know that I can trust. And so here's the question for, for those of us at work. Are you someone that others can trust in? Are you someone others look to? Are you trustworthy? So in all these different ways, our lives should make the gospel attractive. That's the difference the gospel should make to our lives. It should, it should um change us so that our lives are attractive. Now a couple of uh, brief reflections here. In a moment we're going to um, uh, get into groups and have a brief discussion about where we, we see some of this, where well, we've seen some of this in our own experiences, but just a couple of implications. Uh, here's the first one. See the power of personal example. And we were thinking a little bit about this on Wednesday night at Connect Plus if you were there. So often when someone becomes a Christian, uh, it's the Christian life lived in front of them that, that has made them stop and look and wonder where well, someone has said you know that, that that christian they just have something that i don't have and i want to know what it is there obviously is an important place for us christians defending the christian faith i um, using logical arguments that's an important thing um that's a good thing i enjoy doing that myself but the reality is that for most people it's not going to persuade them but what might make them stop and wonder is the beautiful life of godliness and righteousness that they see in a Christian. They just can't explain away something that makes them have to think further. So see the power of personal example. Um, often people are watching us without us really thinking about it. It matters so much as Christians that we are those living in accordance with sound doctrine, uh, that our lives are, are making the gospel attractive. A second implication is this, see the need of the church in discipleship. And we, lost, we thought last week about how elders uh, need to model the gospel uh, because the Christian life is so often caught as much as it is taught. But actually that, that point is really true well beyond the, the realms of, of leadership in the church. Now we need examples throughout the church of godly living at every stage and at every age. Now we need multi-generational discipleship if we're going to grow in maturity as a church. And that means that, that we need to see and to value the role that we each have in helping each other to grow. You see, the best way that we can serve at church is it's not really it's been a rotor, although that's a useful thing. It is to invest in people and perhaps especially in someone that we could be a good example to and get alongside uh, and help grow in maturity in the Christian life. So see the need of the church and discipleship. So the first thing we've seen, our lives should make the gospel attractive. What I want us to do is, is to pause there and just think about how this um, perhaps has played out in, in our own experience and um, a couple of questions for you to think about. You can maybe 
just focus on one if you want to. If you don't get to both, that's fine. First one, uh, where have you seen non-Christians struck by the power of your of personal example? And the second, where have you most appreciated the example of other Christians in your discipleship? Great. OK, H hopefully that's just um, helped you to think a bit about these things. Um, we're going to move on now, though. So we we've seen that the what of uh, discipleship that Paul is looking for is he thinks about these different people in church. But now we're going to think about the how. How is it that we grow in living lives like this? So first, our, our, our lives should make the gospel attractive. Second, because uh, the gospel should change our Lives. So Paul explains the logic in these last verses, um, and we're going to be much more brief here, by the way, uh, of how it is that the Christian changes. And that's a very important thing for us to think about, because I guess um, many of us will know that we should live differently, um, but often we don't perhaps know how to change. Uh, and what we see here is that change happens when we Christians grasp the depths of the gospel more. And, you know, that is it. <laughs> That, that might seem like a bit of a disappointing thing to say, but it is that. It, it is a case of grasping the depths of the gospel more. We don't need anything new. We need to go deeper into what we already have. Look at verse 11. Paul writes this, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify for himself a people that is very own, eager to do what is good. But the heart of, of, of Christianity is this idea of grace, that we're saved not by our good works, but by what Jesus has done. Everything has been done by him. He's paid on the cross for our sins. But what we see here is that this grace, this, this free gift, not only does it save us, but it also teaches us. It teaches us to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. How does the grace of God do that? How, how does it help us to master the monster that is our indwelling sin? Well, first, it, it teaches us to look forward. Verse 13, to this blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You see, one day what we understand is that we're going to meet Jesus and we're going to see him in his glory. And if we are, if we're his, if we're one of his people, this is going to be the happiest day of our lives. It is going to be beyond what we have ever experienced or can possibly imagine. To be with the one who loves us and who has loved us the one who gave himself for us. And on that day, we want to know that we have lived our lives for him. Not, not perfectly, of course not, but as best as we possibly can. We've not wasted our lives in sin. And if we look forward to that day, if that day is in our, is in our minds, it is going to impact the way that we live today. As we look forward to that commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. So the grace of God, it teaches us to look forward and it also teaches us to look back. Uh, we look back at the cross, the, the, the classic Christian hymn, Rock of Ages, uh, talks about the death of Jesus being a double cure. That is, it does two things. On the one hand, it, it saves us from wrath. But on the other hand, also, it makes us pure. Because what we understand is that Jesus died not simply to save us from sin, but to save us for him. The gospel, as I've said, it is not before. It is not just a ticket to heaven. It is power to change us now. Jesus died to purify for himself a people who are his very own. Now that word, um, that phrase here, his very own, is, is, a, is a, a special word that Paul uses. And it has a sense of being a special possession. That's a, it's a very important thing, I think, for us Christians to grasp about what it means to be a Christian. The Christian is a special possession of Christ. We are his very own people. Jesus bought us on the cross and now we belong to him. Uh, if Jesus were doing a show and tell, uh, what would he bring? Now, the answer is he, he'd bring you. You would be the one he would want to show off uh, to the world because he loves you, uh, because he, he treasures you, because he values you. Uh, to Jesus, we are not a statistic 
were a number, a consumer, a producer, a burden, a disappointment, none of those things. We are his special possession, his very own people. And he bought us uh, and he died for us in order that we might belong to him. We're not like that Christmas present that you get. You kind of regret having been given it. You're pretty disappointed. Now, we are um, we, we are a special possession of Jesus. He bought us and he loves us. And see, perhaps one of the reasons I think that we we struggle in our fight with sin, we struggle to live the lives that God has called us to is because we don't really see what value we have to God. So do you know how Jesus sees us? He, he delights in us. And if we know that, if we if we believe that, we're going to want to live for him. This is not a philosophy of of look inside and love yourself. It is look at, look outside and see that you're loved despite yourself. That is what is going to bring change to the Christian. The more we grasp this, the more we grasp the riches of Christ's love, the more eager we will be to please him. So we look back. And, and that is why, verse 15, Paul wants Titus to keep preaching the gospel to Christians. It's why you and I, if we are Christians here this evening, we need to keep on hearing the gospel because this is what is going to change us. The gospel should change our lives. So the question is, do you understand the grace of God? Are you growing in your understanding of the grace of God? And is it changing your life? Are you looking forward? Are you looking back? Because the more we know the love of Christ, says Paul, the more beautiful we'll become the more the world will stop and see the church and want to know the hope that we have. Our life should make the gospel attractive because the gospel should change our lives. I'm going to pray uh, and then I think I'm going to have some moments for questions uh, if, if you've got any. Uh, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this wonderful um, gospel that we have. We thank you um, what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Uh, we thank you that he died for us to make us his own. We thank you for what lies ahead, this unimaginably wonderful moment of meeting Christ in his glory. And Father, we pray that, that these things would transform our lives today, that we might live lives worthy of him and that we might display Christ to the world, that others might come to know the hope that we have we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have time for questions. Uh, verse 15. What does it mean to rebuke with all authority? What things? Um, I, I think probably what he's getting at um, is the idea that, um, okay, so, so, so when there's a similar idea in 2 Timothy when Paul speaks to Timothy about preaching the word and he says um, correct rebuke and encourage and the point is that when when we um, when, when we hear the word of God it, it, it's going to both encourage us and also challenge us both in our thinking um, but also in our living and so the it's, it's not that Titus has a, 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 yeah a sort of his authority comes from from the word as god's servant uh, he himself as as a christian leader in a sense is just another christian but he has particular authority responsibility to care for the church and so i think the point is as he teaches um he, he is to, to to be willing to correct and rebuke as, as well as encourage um and therefore you know the the, the person teaching is because because we have a derived authority that comes from the word of God, we can do we 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 can uh, correct people and rebuke people. Um, that, that's to be done humbly and, and gently, but 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 the authority comes um, from the word. Um, so I think that's that's what he's getting at. Um, okay, some other questions here. Um, uh, question from Rob about. Um, Paul assuming marriage and children are the default position to those he's writing to with us at the same for singles and James also asked how, how what about women who aren't mothers wives living out these verses um yes I, I think um I, I think it is, it is true that I guess that, that it's more common for people um certainly in those times and maybe even today too to, to be married and therefore he's speaking about 
be speaking to, to, into that situation. But I, I think what I what I tried to say was this idea of, I think at, at heart what's going on is, is the significance of relationships um, being the, the one of the key ways in which you live out the Christian faith. And so um, even if you are, yeah, if, you, if you're not married, um, that, that is still very much the case. And as single people, um, there is still a kind of unique role, even, even in the idea of training people to love. That's something that single people can can do as well. Certainly as um, as, a, as, as a as a married man with children, we, we, we as a family massively benefit from the input of single people into our household and um, you know, in, in a very direct way in terms of being encouraged to 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 um, to, to 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 love. Um, so there's that there certainly is that but I think more generally it's just it's recognizing that the things that matter most in life are, are relationships and wanting to pursue those things um it, it, regardless of, of where we find ourselves as to have children or or marriage um a question here about um the workplace any advice for Christians speaking or just living the gospel in the workplace um I think obviously the thing that we're seeing here is the the power of personal example and recognizing how important that is. And so there's that particular challenge for us um, if we're working to be living a distinct life. Um, I guess not just saying, not just thinking about it negatively. Well, as a Christian, I don't do this or I don't do that, but also positively. You know, what what sh what positive things could I be doing um, to to honour my uh, employer, to, to love my colleagues, um, and and stand out, um, and maybe that's being someone who's got time for people, someone who's willing to go the extra mile and care for people and help people out in, in spheres of work, as well as the perhaps more obvious things like you know not gossiping and trying to do things joyfully, not complaining or arguing, and I think those things are are, are going to have an impact, and then it's. Um, it, it, it's seeking to make the most of every opportunity that we have to be able to explain explain the hope that we have. So sort of recognizing how important it is that we live our lives while speaking, whilst knowing that our example itself is not enough. People won't understand the gospel by simply watching our lives, but the point is that they will hopefully want to understand more. So then make the most of those opportunities. Great, um, we'll stop there. Thanks guys.